Hey there, this is Alex South in St. Paul, Minnesota. I want to thank everyone who left feedback for my last video. It, it really meant a lot to me. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm doing these videos um, in part because I want to be uh, an educator, I guess. Um, one of the things that happened with my career tra trajectory is that I uh, I got a bachelor's degree, and then my my career sort of took off at a certain point before I had a master's degree, and so I wasn't uh, able to become a professional teacher, I guess, and uh, never necessarily learned all the skills to do that. Um, but there's there's a part of me that wants to do that. I've been so influenced by by my teachers and so grateful. Um, and, and I try to do it in different ways. And, and one of those ways is by visiting schools. Um, but with the, with the pandemic, those invitations, you know, haven't been coming, of course. And, um, and so I'm trying to figure out ways to do this stuff uh, digitally for the time being until I can do it in person. Um, and actually, even prior to the pandemic, I was I was trying to figure out a way to show books to an audience because that's always um, a struggle in any kind of educational context. It's like these little things. How do you show them? So this is a, a way for me to play with that, and and um, it's also just fun for me. Um, so uh, oh, and there was one other thing I was going to say, uh, which is that. Um, if you're into this and you want more stuff like this, it was brought to my attention that there is this Magnum course in which I talk about my photography and process and all that kind of stuff, um, this Magnum course. And there's a, uh, I was told there's a 20% discount in February if you have a, like a secret code. And of course, I don't remember that secret code right now, but I'll put it in the comment thing or whatever um so anyway but i'm not you know this anyway uh what i want to talk about today is um a certain kind of time and sequencing of images that shapes the way time is experienced within photographic books um and i'm I'm, I'm kind of calling this real time versus story time. Um, it's not really a versus situation. It's more of a spectrum, I guess. But um, uh, so let's just dive in and, and I'll try to explain what I'm talking about. And, and I'm starting with this book called Real Time. And uh, you can see this is a, a pretty beat up copy. Um, but it's something I encounter this work when I was pretty young, and it's it's by Eve Sonneman. Um, and, and so as you can see here, oops, sorry, I'm just looking. There, I'm looking for my little bunny to which I can hold down the pages. Uh, so yeah, Eve Sonneman shot this work in the late 60s, early 70s. And it was published in 76. Um, and so all of... Um, all of the pages are these diptychs. And, and what she does is she's, she's really just showing two moments in time very close together. And, and she's not you know, using a tripod, so it's, um, it's pretty free-flowing. So here on the left, presumably this is her shadow. And then she angles the camera to the right a little bit, gets a little more background, and we see people there. Um, so, so what does this do um, by showing two pictures? It, it shows a brief moment in time, right? Just, a, just almost like a stutter in time. But it's not narrative really. Um, the information back here, the people on the beach, that's not surprising. That's not uh, 
opening up a big story in our imagination. What it's really just doing is expanding the moment. Um, you know, there's so much emphasis in photography is given to this idea, Cartier-Bresson's idea of the decisive moment, the singular moment. But of course, we know things come before and things come after. And it's just showing uh, all of those little increments of moment, momentary looking. Um, so, you know, again, a beach scene. Same here. Um, you know, what information is different between these two pictures? In this one, the boy is looking at the camera. Here he's looking down. Here we see the, the drawing on the sand. Here we see a couple frolicking. Um, and it's just, it's glimpses. And, and I mean, her title, Real Time, to me, w what that is suggestive of is uh, the kind of time where you're just looking and seeing. And it's not necessarily a uh a time for wild imagination or um or storytelling it's a time for observation this book is uh you know like a lot of these 70s books is not well printed uh th this was done by printed matter um Here's another example that's kind of interesting and a little bit different. So you have this, this couple down on, on the ground and these men walking off here. But then in this foreground, you see this man in a suit kind of coming at the camera. So that's a little bit different. And it's, you know, because it's something odd. Why is this man on the rocks? So it's... It, almost is suggestive of the be very beginnings of a story, but not quite. Um, so lots of examples like this. This one is, uh, this picture is a little bit different um, in that it, it, it has the quality of a panorama almost. It's almost seen as one frame. But in fact, it, it, it just appears that this figure has mostly just left the scene. Um, but something about the, the way the light works makes it look like a panorama. Um, so here's another example where it's a street scene. So now we're off the beach and, and you could imagine, you know, maybe this photograph as a sort of, you know, classic street photograph. So we don't look at this for a second. Um, and so we, you know, we have this n nicely composed man in the foreground with the cigar. Uh, you get some information with the signs back here. And then the person, the shoe shiner and the person looking down. And then you look over here, that man's gone. The guy getting the shoe shine is looking at the camera. Um, so is the man in the background. So it's, it's like a less perfect street photo in which there's an awareness of the photographer. And, and it's just this little shift in time. And, and this strategy um, used in this book, you know, it's not, it's not something to be done forever necessarily, but, it's, um, but it, it, you know, it has artistic merit. Um, and it always kind of stuck in my head. Here's this one I like. It's, um, I mean, this just feels like a contact sheet in which, you know, it's just slightly different moment, um, you know, of the inhaling of the cigarette. Very little information in the background is different. Um, but that little, that little shift makes it feel more like, almost like a video um, and, and it just, it, it, for me, it activates a different kind of seeing than when I'm just focused on the single photograph. So I've thought about this book, you know, over the years and, 
and and I've thought about other people that have used this strategy. Um, you know, one thing I want to say about these talks here is that I am not so. I am not a scholar by any means, and uh, and you know, I never took a history of photography class, uh, for example, and and I'm really just using what's in my library. So th there's probably you know a hundred examples of things like this, um, but. But I'm just talking as you know, as a photographer, stuff that I'm interested in and stuff that I have access to. So, another uh, another work from that same period of time is by Jan Jan Groover, um, and and her, you know her early work, she she did stuff with diptychs that was very similar. I I almost wonder. If uh, if she and Eve Sonneman knew each other or influenced by each other, um, but you see this strategy: the the object in the center and the car moving in the background do two different cars. The thing about Jan Groover is that it's to me it's more of a formal exercise. Let me move over here to the, these color ones. She's better known for the, these color um, diptychs and triptychs and so forth. Um, but in, in her case, the camera is stable in position, presumably on a tripod. And, and to me, that gives it the feeling, it's a little bit less of this flicker of time than it is a formal exploration. And it becomes about, in this case, when she's in switching to color about the different colors that appear in the frame at a given time. So it's it's not exactly the same as the Eve Sonneman approach. The person that I think has um, has used this strategy strategy most effectively is Robert Adams. And and he's used it in a number of books. Um, but I was going to show this book which is appropriately called Time Passes. And and it's a pretty fascinating use of this. So the pictures are um, incredibly simple. So, so here we are. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. So we're at the seaside with these rocks in the foreground. And then we turn the page. So it's the same scene, but different. And, and, and I have to say, that this, this technique of this, this slippery time, to me, it, it actually functions better for me when I have a flip of the page, because then I'm, I, have the, I have to use my memory for the previous image or flip back and forth. So here to here. Um, is this a different day? Is the light different? It's hard to say. I mean, it's it's probably the same day, but maybe slightly different time. Um, the framing's not perfect. You know, there's a, a slight tilt to the horizon, so it's handheld, and it feels like fluid seeing. Here again, are we slightly lower in this picture? The sea is slightly higher. Um, so we're just moving incrementally. Um, it's quite possible that all of these were taken on the same day. Look at these two. I love I, I love when he does this. Um, so it's almost identical, but not. So you have this this pool of water right here, and then it's not there here. Is this the same group of rocks? This, this, and this sure feel alike. Uh, so, and what this does is it, you know, like Eve Sonneman, it makes you look closely. But there's even less information in terms of people and movement and all that sort of stuff. So you start looking really, really closely, and you're looking at the, you know, the patterns that the waves make and so forth in a way that is probably a little bit different than if you were looking at a singular picture.
this text page says um, uh, the Columbia River flows for 1,200 miles before disappearing into the sea. The beautiful place of its dissolution is approached by a channel between jetties, a last straightening. There are lighthouses above the North, sh north Shore. So he mentions lighthouses, and it's going to be hard for you to see this, but there is, if you look really closely, there's a lighthouse back there. Can I lift that up, and can you see it? Kind of? Yeah, so there's a lighthouse back there. And then we see this fence, and when we back up, here's the fence here. Now we're backed up. We know we're at that lighthouse. So we've moved possibly all the way down here, here, and then we've backed up. Um, so this little sequence, it's quite subtle, but to me, that's the beginnings of a different kind of time. So that's not this momentary time of looking around. That's an actual, uh, almost a, a narrative time. It's almost moving through space. Slight, but it's so subtle um, that it's hard to say. And then, and then we're moving around. But again, repetition, the logs, the logs again. Now here, the clouds. So slight shifts in weather. Okay, look at the rocks down here. So subtle. Another change that's happening is this line right here becomes the horizon. This, this, uh, this wave line becomes the horizon, and here it's gone. And so the, the horizon almost blends into the sky. And, and you're able to see subtleties like that because of the kind of deep looking that this, um, that this repetition helps accentuate. Okay. So another photographer um, that uses that kind of real time in a similar way is Guido Guidi. And, and like Robert Adams, um, he does this through various projects. I'm just gonna make myself smaller here if I can. Um, this book is called Fiume, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, which means river. And you'll see um, that it's in color, but something very similar is happening here, and it's um, and I think it's, you know, it's notable that uh, he's using water in, a, in the same way that Adams. So that, um, you know, because obviously like a river running water um, is, you know, is the ultimate metaphor of uh, nothing stays in the same place ever, that every, everything is moving. Um, so, so here to here. To here, and so um, he's he's giving you both experiences: the memory of this picture. I'm just going to darken it up here, and then you get to compare two photographs. Um, and this really has that Eve Sonneman like, f you know, flickering back and forth in time. Um, just just the slightest shift, which which prompts you to look more deeply. Though this diptych functions more like a panorama, so it's not always this the same strategy. Here, the camera has definitely moved this way. And, that, and, you, and you have singular photographs like this. And this is what I love is, um, is that Adams and, and Guidi uh, don't repeat that strategy every time. 
Um, so you, you have moments of, of stuttering time and then single moments as well. And so then I like this, putting two single moments next to each other. And then very similar pictures. It's very hard to discern what's different. This log in the water here is slightly more submerged in this case, but, but the framing is identical. It's on a tripod. And then surprises. But, you know, you see this hose moving through the frame. And what's kind of great is that Guidi's put you in a mindset, a real meditative mindset, so that when you come to this child, it's, it's almost a jarring picture. Um, and I also, I, I have to say that like Adams, I love the, the casualness of the framing. I mean, it's so strange to have his feet so close to the edge of the, of the frame. Um, but it makes it feel um, impromptu, I guess. Another surprise. In my last video on Eggleston, I talked about difficult pictures, and, and some people asked what I meant by that, and I just meant um, not not uh, easily appreciated by a general audience, I guess, that aren't obviously um, compositionally pretty or satisfying. Um, and and, and Guidi uh, definitely takes this to another level. And because he, um, because he's also, in, in this case, using a larger format camera, there's a sense of even more intentionality behind it. Um, so he's deaf, you know, there's no question that he set up his camera this way to make that picture, um, which is a little bit different than Eggleston's, um, you know, always handheld photography. Okay, it's so here to here. And, and Guidi is so great at just at moving your eyes around and then, you know, so repetition, slight movement, and then having surprises. And so when I come to a picture like this, which, so now we're outside of nature. Um, and it's, you know, it's such a flat picture. It, you know, has no space in it. So it's the kind of photograph that maybe uh, I would just flip right by. But because I've been attuned, because I've slowed down and looked more closely in the previous pictures, it, 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 it feels satisfying. My senses are alive. And I'm looking at how these fake brick tiles fell off and and the fact that they match this tile down here and you know and it's um i'm experiencing it in a different way because i've been primed by the previous pictures okay um that so that brings me to paul graham who has has worked with time, especially um, you know over the last decade, in really interesting ways. And and I want to start with with this book, which is is more recent, um, called The Present, uh, because I think it functions uh, in a similar way as Adams and Guidi and Eve Sonneman, um in terms of that real time, that 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 being present in the movement of time. This book might be a little challenging um, 
to show on the screen because yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm only gonna show certain spreads here. Um, so let's ignore that. Let's ignore that. Um, simply because it's because of the foldouts, it's a little trickier. Okay, so this is a good example. I'm also going to zoom in a bit. Um, so, on the left, we have this scene. Okay, this is a uh, this this has this quality of a you know of a strong uh, classic street photo. Although most um, most classic street photos would have. A lot of depth of field so he's using limited depth, depth of field to pull this man out of space um, so this woman in the foreground becomes a compositional element but he's the focus and then in this frame she's virtually gone there's a bird he's now out of focus and this woman is in focus and she becomes the kind of um, the kind of key subject, and and what Graham is then doing is he's moving our eye, you know, he's guiding our eye, and he's making sure we see her, and then we go back to this photograph, and we can, you know, we we note the people in the background maybe in a slightly different way. Uh, and we, you know, now we notice that the pigeon is here. We weren't, didn't really pay any attention to it before, but it becomes a key element here. And that's done through this, this kind of time flickering. Uh, and, and Graham is using different strategies uh, to lay out the photograph. So your eye is bouncing around the page and and by opening up the spreads or turning pages, and in this case, uh, presenting two images together, much like Eve Sonneman would have. Um, and let's just let's just zoom in again because there's a there's a lot of information in these photographs. Okay, so what are we looking at? We're looking at a woman with a banana. Okay, a man behind with a cane, another woman with a cane here. And now let's look at this one. Now the blind man becomes very apparent. He becomes the focus. Um, so really, Graham uh, is using two different moments of time, like Eve Sonman, but depth of field becomes a key way of moving our eye around. Okay, so now I want to get into this distinction between uh, what we're calling real time, that strategy that we've just seen, and narrative time. And, and it's always tricky talking about narrative and photography, um, but in, in terms of this kind of sequence work, we, you know, we often think about Dwayne Michaels and, and his photo sequences and the fact that they have such a like a kind of narrative structure and i'm not going to spend a ton of time on this but but you can see how this sequence uh functions not unlike paul graham's street scenes um but it's given all of this kind of staged narrative quality um and it's it's less about the moment than about telling a story so I'll just flip through here. Two men crossing in the street. The man looks back. And then this man looks back. Um, I guess it's the, the knowing that it's staged that, for me, makes it feel more narrative-ish. But also um, the context and the context of Dwayne Michael's work, which is you know always has this staged element okay so this this is what we think of with narrative uh 
sequences, but it's it's not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about a, a more subtle kind of narrative and and something that's much closer to the Guidi Adams uh, kind of real time strategy, but with an element of narrative is the book The Pond by John Gossage. Um, and this, this distinction is, is quite subtle, but let me see if I can explain it. Darken this up. So we start uh, with this first picture, okay? And we've got pavement over here and this rocky road over here. Okay? And then this road, which is, which is even less than a rocky road, but still kind of a road. And now a footpath. And a footpath. And so what this is doing for me is it's taking me on a walk. It, it has a bit of a linear narrative movement where I have gone from the street into the brush. Another path. This one's really funny because it's, it's, it's almost like a gateway. It's like, okay, we've gone from the path, now we're entering <laughs> off the path. Um, and we're just in the bramble. But then, then that narrative sort of stops and, and we're moving around and then suddenly we're looking up. And, and what's kind of interesting about this diptych, um, first of all, it's because of that shift in perspective uh, and because of the subtlety of the first pictures, it's, uh, it's jarring. Um, and then between the two photographs, it has that real time kind of flicker so that you know we can we can see how this branch is probably this branch so it has this this quality of just looking around and looking up and looking around um, and then we're back down and and it feels like we're back on the walk and it continues on i don't have to go through the whole book um, oh, but th there is a moment coming up that I want to show. I think it's, we're almost there. Oh yeah, this one. Uh, so this pair of images pops up and this, this feels so much like that passing time book by Robert Adams just very subtle shifts of the eye. And, and again, you know, this use of water. Um, and, and, and so the book carries on, um, but what adds for me to the, this narrative quality is the ending. So we're seeing these, these this water, uh, these, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't actually feel like one pond. It feels like this could be the pond. Um, but then we move out of it. So there's this built structure back here. And then we're back on the road. And then we're approaching the house in the backyard. Definitely, you know, like in a, uh, you know, in a neighborhood. Um, so we're really in a neighborhood. But again, um, Gossage has, has primed our eyes so that we're, we're able to kind of, you know, look at this this paving, which has been redone multiple times, and in, and, and kind of enjoy it, where we're, we're, um, our palate has been made sensitive, so we can kind of savor this this peculiar uh, pavement job. And then it 
for the final picture, it moves inside. And this picture, more than any other, to me, gives this the feeling of narrative. So it has this kind of real-time flicker and then an overarching narrative of a walk. And another project that does something similar, it goes back to, to Paul Graham and, and his Shimmer Possibility. Um, so most of you probably know, but Shimmer Possibility is made up of a number of books. I, um, I forget how many, I just have a, a few of them here. And, and each book is a sequence. Um, and, and this one functions uh, in a way that's, that's pretty similar to that John Gossage book. Uh, okay, so we have a man walking down a path. It's hard for you to see that here, but, um, but that's a, a cat on the path. Uh, it almost looks like he's walking his cat. Okay, now no cat and the man. And this is this gets super interesting here. So, um, it it's hard to see this because he's he's uh, he's in the, he's photographed in the shadows. It's a subtle picture. Um, so it's a portrait and it's a pose portrait. I mean, we're very aware that the photographer is standing here. We know that he's aware of it. Um, so, th so there's a feeling that this man just came walking along. Uh, presumably the photographer, you know, sees him, sees this cat. Oh, that's interesting. Here comes the man and he takes his picture. Flip the page and there's his picture again. And, and so this has that flicker of time quality, but, but Graham challenges you. <laughs> Uh, further to say like, wait, is this a flicker of time or is this the same picture? And uh, you, so I'm, I'm convinced that they're different pictures, and, but it is so hard to tell. The, the place where I, I think I see it is like, so right under his ear here. Okay, see that little crescent of light? seems a little bit smaller <laughs> there uh, but his expression the framing it's it, you know you can hold the two here like that is virtually identical everywhere but I, I think it's different but he's really like challenging the viewer and then we come and now the cat's just sleeping in the Sun uh, so a narrative is forming. Oh, it's not the man's cat. The cat is just wandering around out here. And now we're following the cat. This is almost like a portrait of the cat. And then these gestures, um, maybe the man is signaling, oh, this is the direction I'm going, or this is where I live, or what have you. Look at the cat again. And then, sorry, it's hard to see here, but the man walking to uh, a motel. And, and that information in particular adds a narrative. So we start, you know, I think, oh, he lives at the hotel, you know, and, and maybe he was, he was walking home from uh, collecting cans or something, you, you know, so, and, and the cat, he just stumbled upon, he has no connection to the cat whatsoever, you know, so you're like generating a narrative. So that is a, a different phenomenon than, than Graham's book, The Present, where it's just two moments in time. Um, and, and it's really just about seeing and it's not about storytelling. So in, uh, in each one of these books, the, the story is a little bit different. And, and the one we showed is quite straightforward. But in, in this, which is probably the most famous of, of 
these sequences, the story functions in a different way. So we have this man mowing, mowing the lawn. I'll brighten this up. And then these cans on a shelf, okay? So you start there and there's no connection. Back to the man mowing the lawn. And then we're back on the shelf. So the repetition here, for me, um, activates a narrative impulse. So I see him here wiping his brow. Um, presumably, you know, it's hot out, he's working. I, you know, I don't know why I start like creating this narrative that it's the weekend, that this is like a weekend job that he does this lawn mowing. Um, but those cans then become connected to him. He's thinking about lunch or this is what he's going to do after he's done mowing the lawn is he's going to go get lunch. And I can almost picture him there at the market figuring out what he's going to have for lunch. And then this, the most famous picture of all, um, where we see the rain falling on the hot day. So it's like relief and something beautiful happening. And this beautiful light, the sunset, and the awaiting meal. His car, it is... You know, and I say, so I say his car. There's no reason. I mean, this could have been made somewhere else entirely. But I'm connecting these pictures. I'm, I'm creating a narrative. And so this, again, is what I mean by this, this slight distinction between a, a kind of narrative time and uh, a more present, real time, what, what Graham calls the present in that book. I don't know if I, I have a, a really great way to sum this up, but but I just wanted to to make that distinction between these different subtle ways of, of showing time and and open up the possibilities um, to use that. In my own case, I've almost never used that kind of flickering time that we're talking about. Um, but I I have used, or there are strategies for using a suggestion of narrative um, that's very subtle. Um, and, and in the same way that Graham, you know, you, you have the, the picture of the food following the picture of the, of the man mowing the lawn and making a connection. And, and it's almost like a, a poetic connection um, rather than a, a temporal connection. Um, and, and I've often used that strategy. But I'm just kind of opening up different possibilities for using time. So that's my little chat. And I um, hope you liked it. And, and uh, yeah, let's do this again sometime. Thanks so much.